Welcome everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Jackie Meyer. I'm a volunteer for the Village of Mamaroneck Arts Council. Um, the council is happy to bring you the ninth uh, in our series of Art Life Lectures. Um, this is part of our initiative to make art more visible to the community. Um, the series continues on March 18th. We're going to have Siddhar Arat speak on Islamic art. And on April 22nd, we have um, Jill Kiefer, who's going to talk about art of 1968 in conjunction with the community-wide read um, that the community's doing for the month of April of the book, 1968, by Mark Kurlansky. And we are also planning a talk on Baroque music and the harpsichord, so that's in the future. Um, the Arts Council um, also organizes Poetry Live, the 4th of July concert, and the summer Sunday concerts on the sound, among other events. So we're, we're quite busy. Um, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Kathleen Reckling. Kathleen joined the team of Arts Westchester in 2011, and since then she has managed over 40 curatorial public art projects at Art Westchester's gallery and non-traditional spaces. Reckling was the curator of the NEA grant-funded exhibitions Crossing Borders in 2015, she in 2016, as well as the NYSCA grant-funded exhibition Give Us the Vote in 2017. In 2015, she was named one of Westchester's most influential business leaders under the age of 30 in 914 Inc.'s Wonderkins edition. Before Arts Westchester, Kathleen was a curatorial assistant at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian and a curatorial intern at the Museum of Modern Art. She holds a bachelor's in economics and art history from Columbia College and a master's in art history and art criticism from Columbia University. So let's give Kathleen a warm welcome. Thank you, Jackie, so much for inviting me into the Village of Marinette Arts Council for having me. There's a lot of familiar faces many of you have had a chance to work with, and I hope to get to know some of you better as artists or in whatever capacity your interest is in the arts. Um, so my talk is called Five Women Artists You Should Know, and we're going to play a little game. Who aren't free to catalog? So we're going to play a little game to start. That's why Jorge is here. Jorge is my traveling garden gnome. So I started a little social media game and prep for this and ask people to guess who the five artists were that I was going to talk about. So far no one else has gotten, no one's gotten it right. So we're going to see if anybody here can find my five artists. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you Jorge. You get Jorge, you have to name as many women artists as you can. As soon as you go um, pause, or if you repeat an artist that somebody else has already mentioned, or if I decide you're being a show-off and are naming too many, <laughs> I'm going to take Jorge away and I'm going to pass it off to someone else. All right? So. All right. Oh, here, here's how I do. I'll give you a tap. You're getting it. All right, I'm going to give you a second. Ready? You can do it. Whatever. Just go with one. Just go with one. Um, um. The first one's always the artist. Louis Perfect. Perfect. Um, I think that's the greatest American artist. Um, oh Alright, don't worry. Alright. George O'Keefe. Yes, that's yes, what I was going to say. I was going to say Louise. <laughs> <laughs> um, George O'Keefe. I'm on. Yeah, your turn. Alright, she's handing it to you. Go ahead, just touch it at least. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say George O'Keefe. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yes. All right. Good. Got another? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. Fine. Right. Shockingly really difficult, right? Yeah. I, I, I think what they what they paint, like 1920s, that lady based in England who came to the bridge. I don't know her name is. That's a. We'll take it. Oh, America's side. Yeah. Oh, Artemis Gentile. Artemis Gentile. Okay. 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 Alright, All right. good job. Alright. Everybody I know can say that. Alright. So that, that proves a point, which is that it's very hard for people to name Kara Walker. Kara Walker is a great one. So I'm not talking about any of those. Um, but it's very hard for people to name five women artists. 
typically if you were to do this and ask people and put them in a corner and say, name five, the five that are probably most likely to come up are Frida Kahlo, Georgia O'Keeffe, mm -hmm. Yayoi Kusama, particularly right now with her infinity rooms, everyone's lining up to get their Insta shots. Cindy Sherman, right? And probably right now, Amy Sherald. So I'm not talking about any of those either. The five that I am going to talk about though are Emily Carr, Lorna Simpson, Toyin Oduatula, Zoe Buckman, and Alexandra Bell. And so I picked these artists for a few reasons. One, Emily Carr is Canada's Frida Kahlo. So if we did this exercise in Canada and if Emily Carr wasn't the first name out of your mouth, you'd lose your Canadian Canadian citizenship. <laughs> send out of the country. Um, Lorna is a highly influential artist. She sort of broke the door open for conceptual photography, but also for women of color in the art space. Toyin, Zoe, and Alexandra are kind of in the emerging artist space. They're all sort of in their 30s, but you will have seen them in the news, New York Times, Vogue, New Yorker, all within the last year. In fact, all of these artists have been in the news outside of, say, arts news within the last year. So Emily Carr is the only historical artist I'm going to talk about, meaning that she's the only one that isn't still living and working. Mm -hmm. The others are all living and working. Oh. So Emily Carr, like I said, she's Canada's, uh, Canada's Frida Kahlo. She was born and died in Victoria, British Columbia. So I first got to know Carr's work when I was actually out in British Columbia. There's Jorge. <laughs> Um, he got to take some photos with uh, some contemporary First Nations totem poles, so just a little lingo. In Canada, uh, Native Americans and Indians are referred to as First Nations. Um, so that's the term that I'll be using while I talk about Emily Carr. Um, the picture on the right was one I took at the University of British Columbia in their Museum of Anthropology, and that's a totem from the Northwest Coast village. Um, they're pretty spectacular and it's hard not to feel very um, small at their feet and so I sort of owe Carr and the Northwest Coast a lot because that's what really got me interested in, in talking about art and working about art, working on art. So Carr, uh, she said, oh the West, I'm of it and I love it. That's a picture of her later in life. Um, Carr was an active painter throughout her career. She grew up in, um, in Victoria. She got some training in the U.S. down in this uh, San Francisco area and then eventually went and did what most artists did at that time, which was go to France. Except Carr really didn't like to speak French. She didn't speak French. Um, so she actually stayed outside of Paris and studied originally in Brittany. So like I said, she's... Canada's Frida Kahlo, but if you were to pick someone to play her in a movie, it would more likely be Judi Dench rather than Salma Hayek. <laughs> Judi Dench is a badass, so that's appropriate. <laughs> um, but also, Carr really came into prominence when she was uh, when she was in her 50s. So her first sort of series of paintings that she's really famous for are these very impressionistic, um, very light-filled paintings of. First Nations villages on the west coast of Canada. Um, you can see the inhabitants of the villages. Um, there's a lot of like softness about them. And she kind of went about documenting First Nations life with a lot of vigor. She was prolific. Um, she was also earning a living as an art teacher. This is another painting from that same period, and you can see this is a watercolor. So sort of really, um, you can see the strong influence of kind of the fauves, the impressionists, some of the post-impressionists that she was working around um, when she was in France. So these are from, both of these paintings are from 1912, a year after she returned from, from her time in France. But she basically spent 15 years working in complete isolation. British Columbia, I'm sorry, yes, go ahead. Do you mind? Um, is it oil on canvas? Um, this is one it? is. Okay. This one is watercolor. Um, so British Columbia was actually the last province in Canada to be settled. So when she was in the early part of the 20th century in the 1910s and 12s, 
it was fairly uninhabited by you know white European settlers, and there was a, a larger indigenous population. But at the same time, you kind of have like the uh, Edward Curtis syndrome in Canada, which was basically that people felt that the Aboriginal tribes were a dying race. Let's go out and document them. So she was kind of part of that group, mm -hmm. but she was very sincere about it because <coughs> these were her neighbors. These were community members that she grew up with. She was given the name um, Clee Wick, which later became the title of a memoir, and that means laughing one. So she was very well liked. Her career totally changed in 1927. Um, she, was in, she submitted 65 paintings, 65 paintings, for consideration for an exhibition um, that was meant to expose the world to the wonder of Northwest Coast First Nations art. 20, 31, 31 were accepted. And so Carr made her way out to Ottawa from Victoria, it's a really long haul at that time, um, to attend the opening of the exhibition. So her paintings, which you can see, there's one and there's another, were installed alongside uh, works by First Nations artists. And there was a really cute little snippet from her diary that I have to share. Um, she said, I long to do some hanging. Ugh, men talk and squint and haggle so long over hanging. <laughs> she felt she could have got it off a lot faster than the gentleman did. She was talking, right? Um, and I only say that from having to hang a lot of artwork. Um, the exhibition was really well received. Um, however, so the day after the exhibition, Carr did get a nice mention in the newspaper. And the writer said, Working for 15 or more years without recognition, it must have been some source of keen gratification to her and everybody interested in the preservation of Indian art that she has at last been discovered. That was it. Carr was pretty pissed because nobody paid attention to her work as a work of art. It was treated as basically a photograph, a sort of documentary material. On the upside, Carr, this got Carr into the circle called the Group of Seven. The Group of Seven were the rock stars of Canada's art world at the time. They were seven men, all British born, mostly working in the province of Ontario, and they were painting Canada's big wild, um, basically without any evidence of human interaction, right? So Carr, we saw in her earlier paintings, the totem poles, the people, the villages. She saw nature and man kind of living together out in the West. And much like our Hudson River School painters, the group of seven were like, let's just paint the trees. Um, of, those, of those artists though, she and Lauren Harris, this is his work here, developed a friendship. And he said to her, you are one of us. He felt Carr was doing work that was as important in terms of creating a Canadian modernism as they were. And Carr's work immediately changed after that trip. She also got to be very good friends with Mark Toby from Seattle. Um, I'm not a huge fan of his, but apparently he's very popular. Um, and so when Carr returned to Victoria, her work took on a totally different uh, style. Um, she was still very interested in Native American life, and I'm just going to talk about the sort of two main groups of paintings that she did in this time and try to get through them fairly quickly because I can talk like for an hour on Emily Carr. Um, but this is one of her pieces, uh, the Indian Church, which she made in 1929, and it's sort of upheld as kind of her masterpiece. Mm -hmm. um, the trees take on these incredible geometric forms. Um, there are a lot, they, she's lost kind of that uh, bright, light infused palette and instead she's kind of interested in the spiritual characteristic of these places and trying to sort of capture that feeling of smallness or of awe that you have when you're in them. And so you, again just in comparison to those earlier paintings of the totem poles here they're the signs of life but really the interest is in the objects um, in their place in the wilderness and that sort of repetition or the parallels of forms within the totems and also within the landscape. So these are the works that really became um, the ones that she was best known for. And this here is just a photo from 1901 of uh, London Harbor. 
and then her painting of the same location on the left. And there's also about a 30 year difference between the two, so, and also about a 15 year space in her work. So the photograph you can see, it's an active sort of fishing harbor and there's people along the pier. Her painting though, it's just about the totems. That's what's being left behind as these communities are being shifted from their, you know, from where they were as First Nations to now these sort of cities are being pushed onto reservations. This is also one of her most famous pieces. It's called uh, Big Raven. The raven in First Nations uh, folklore is the trickster. He's attributed to a lot of creation myths. So he's a very important character. There was a really um, huge exhibition at the mm -hmm. Vancouver Art Gallery in 2007 called Raven Traveling, and that was all um, First Nations art, um, particularly of the Northwest Coast. And then the other body of work that she did at this time were, um, have been referred to as her spar tree paintings. Um, if you are New York Times subscribers, you might have seen Emily Carr's name come up over the summer. There's actually a travel article that used her paintings kind of as a guide through uh, British Columbia, or particularly the coastal areas. Um, and that particular writer was interested in these works as sort of environmentalist warnings, which they were up until a point. So um, the spar trees are the trees that are left behind during logging. They're actually what the loggers will kind of will climb up and then they'll sort of send saws out from a lot around them and sort of cut all the trees down in a circle. So those are the trees that are not good enough for limber and are the basis for the loggers to work from. So these paintings, which have a sort of like a Van Gogh kind of style, um, were her way of kind of dealing with all of a sudden this sky opening up in what were rainforests in her community. And they take on a kind of when you read her diaries from that time and her writings about them, they take on a kind of biblical tone to her. Because the thing is, the prevailing attitude at the time, this is called uh, Log Over Hillside. This was done in the 30s. So what was happening in America in the 30s, in the South, after all the, the, the clear cutting, was the Dust Bowl period. And she had been in the States and had seen what had happened with the Dust Bowl. And so she was very aware of the potential for environmental ruin. But she was also a student of what was the conservationist language at the time. She had also witnessed um, the rainforest of Vancouver reclaim uh, native villages once they were abandoned. So she really believed that ultimately nature would revive itself and reclaim this area that had been logged over. So the trees kind of take on these like, you know, crucifix type forms, little little Jesus reference in them. So one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about Carr, besides the fact that I love her work, um, and because in a lot of ways she's overlooked, um, Ross King, if any of you are familiar with him, he wrote Pope's Ceiling and The Judgment of Paris. He's like a popular art historian. He wrote a very nice writer. Turns out he's Canadian. Um, and he wrote in 2010 a book called Defiant Spirits. And that was focusing on the rise of Canadian modernism around the time of the Group of Seven. Carr gets four mentions in a 600-page book. There's a very prestigious art school named after Carr, and a lot of important Canadian artists really owe a lot to Carr and consistently cite her as an influence. So it was a little bit of a elimination in the sort of writing of the popular history. Um, so one of those artists that frequently references Carr is Jeff Wall, a um, conceptual Canadian photographer who's one of the top selling Canadian artists. Carr herself fetches around 1.5 to 3.5 million at auction, but her work doesn't come up that regularly for auction. Um, so this is a work by Wall where you can see a little bit of parallel between her works, her spar tree paintings. Um, and he says, Carr was an originary force of modern art in the West representative of traditions in which all of us who work here are in some way or another involved. Um, there's other First Nations artists who grapple with her legacy. In the 90s, she kind of fell out of favor, um, right? She was a, a white woman who was painting indigenous populations. Um, and as there was a rise in uh, Canadian art historians and First Nation Canadian art historians, they were kind of looking at her through a post-colonial lens. 
Um, but eventually she was sort of reinstated as valuable because she was coming at it as an artist of her time, of a woman of her time, and was really sincere about caring for these people. She wasn't Gauguin, like heading out to Tahiti and, you know, giving, sort of butchering the language and like popping it on titles. She was a little bit more of the West. Now we're going to meet Lorna Simpson. Is anyone familiar with her work? Mm -hmm. Lorna Simpson is probably a, one of the more important artists working right now. It's a little bit about her work, and it's an important setup. Um, the only thing I can hope the viewer will get from the work is something about the structure of the work. I would be asking too much, I think, for them to get my exact intention. So that should already give you an idea for going conceptual here. Um, Lorna was the first uh, African American and I, to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale, um, and that was in 1990. Um, in 2007, she actually had a major retrospective at the Whitney, so she's considered very influential. She also is credited basically with um, blowing the door open for conceptual photography. So this work, Water Bearer, Mm -hmm. um, is basically considered one of her um, most you know, canonical artworks and one that kind of really changed the discourse around race. Um, so I'm going to give you a second to kind of look at this and internally respond and then if someone wants to kind of tell me the story that they see in this or tell me kind of what they're thinking about it, I think that might be a good place to, to keep going with Lorna. Anybody? I feel like Kat, you, you're definitely. Me? Yeah, tell you to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely see you know, that there's like a colonial side with this kind of the metal jug versus this plastic one, which looks like a more refugee or third world, but though I hate to use that term now, kind of reference. So I see this kind of Eastern or, you know, um, Something like that, a rich and a poor culture difference. Um, or one is serving someone else, maybe one is serving your own people. I don't know what these different kind of images come into it. So. Also, I, I'm, I'm surprised that she's emptying out the water. Yeah, she's wasting it. I would think that she'd need to gather it. And that's, that's really what struck me. I don't understand why she's pitching the water. Yeah, it doesn't make a, that sort of doesn't make a lot of sense. And there are a lot of like triggers in it. And then what's, when I asked you both, your first response was to the image and sort of decoding the image. But the whole work includes the vinyl text that's on the wall. I, I, I thought the, the words, they're asking her to talk, to pour out what she saw. So she's sort of pouring out what she saw, unfortunately. The last line says it's not valued very much. Yeah, only to discount her memory, right? And her back is to us. So there's all of these sort of mysteries in this. How do we decode this work? And that's this is sort of very emblematic of Lorna's work as a whole. She's playing with text, the meaning of text, the meaning of narrative and symbols, right? There's a, a reference here to the scales of justice that sort of seem out of balance, um, the weight of the picture. Um, of that metal picture that maybe it's 18th century, maybe it's a reference to the slave trade, maybe it's not, you know, maybe this is a reference to refugees in third world, maybe it's not, you know, that seems to be pulling her in one direction. Um, she also has no particular identity. She's wearing this white um, sort of shift dress that's sort of denying her gender um, and also sort of a reference to uh, lower income or again to the slave trade. So there's all this stuff that's like in there that you are allowed to unpack and just like Lorna said in that quote is you don't need to kind of get it all but the question that you should be asking is how is this thing made and why am I why am I going through this process and what do these things that are coming up mean so my introduction to Lorna's work was actually through nine props and I actually only saw one of them, it was this one. And when you first take a look at these, these kind of look like something that you would find maybe in a really old like Sotheby's catalog or like a state sale catalog. So an object with then an old school typewriter text, a description underneath. 
So I'm going to bring up two of them, and I'm going to tell you what one of them says. And it's going to be the one on the left. The title of it is called Before the Battle, 1920, by James Van Der Zee. Calendar image for the Elks Convention taken in an apartment on 139th Street. A woman wearing a kimono is seated in a rocking chair with a cigarette in her left hand and a rolling pin in her right with her legs crossed. A fringe lamp positioned right behind her lights her face. Hand-painted smoke trails from the tip of the cigarette. A deer's head is mounted on the wall with two framed images of figures bathing, a floral design and a mirror at the center of the arrangement. At her feet are an array of objects, three milk bottles, several cups and saucers stacked, and four irons. Her husband would get home late that night, and if his explanation wasn't satisfactory, well, she had all the ammunition there to blast him with. <laughs> the one closer to me is called Dinner Party with Boxer Harry Wills, 1926, by James Andrews E. So all nine props, let's go back to a second, are objects that are in James Van Der Zee portraits. Who's James Van Der Zee? James Van Der Zee was a really important uh, Renaissance era photographer in New York City. He was African American, and it was his studio that you would go to if you were a black family or a black person in Harlem um, of a rising class that wanted to have your portrait taken. He was the guy. Um, he also photographed um, many community groups and was really kind of part of creating an identity for a rising middle class of African American population in New York. Um, Van Der Zee eventually uh, stopped taking photographs. And through, it was his second wife, Donna, who really kind of pushed him to get back in the game. And so in the 80s, he kind of returned to the camera and was shooting people like Basquiat, Bill Crosby, you know, the African American celebrities of the 1980s. Van was also part of a, a few major exhibitions at the Met, and he completely fell into obscurity. But he's a very important photographer in terms of creating an African American <coughs> identity in that time between 1917 and the Second World War. So just to show you in contrast, these are Van's portraits. Um, and so I stumbled on these works because at the time, um, I was working with Donna Van Der Zee um, and started to go through um, his archives. We wanted to do an exhibition of his work at Arts Westchester and hadn't quite figured out the angle. So it's taken us nearly five years, but we just were awarded an NEA grant. So we will be doing an exhibition that's inclusive of his work, um, some never before seen portraits. So that's a little plug for things to come actually in 2019. So nice. um, But just the big difference, right? So these are the same titles, but these are Van's portraits. Um, and so, again, her, that whole body of work is really about what is narrative? How do you construct narrative? Those are just the objects, right? There's the martini glass that's in her picture on the right, and there are the milk bottles that are in her photograph. Um, this is probably one of her better known works. Um, one of the labels that she's been given is the anti-portraitist. The anti um, and this is a piece called Five Day Forecast. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, so just like the water bearer, same sort of denial of gender in the white shift dress. There's sort of a, a reference to the drudgery of the work week. Um, but she's also playing with the language. All the words at the bottom, mistranslate, misconstrue, misgage, misremember, mistranscribe, misfunction, misdiagnose, misidentify, misinformation, misdescription. All reference sort of breakdowns in communication, um, a lack of understanding. But then there's also a little play on miss. So, misinformation, Ms. the lady. So, Lorna has been with, or had been with Salon 94 for probably close to a decade. So, a pretty major gallery that has one of the best track records for showing women artists. Um, she recently decided that she was going to move to Hauser and Worth, which is a pretty big deal because Hauser and Worth is one of the mega galleries. Um, and also, on that report card um, for parity, gender parity, um, they rank pretty low. So Lorna moving over to them is fairly significant in terms of gaining more, even more recognition, but also because she's 
completely changing the direction that she's going with her work. Um, she was actually featured, this is completely lucky because she was originally on my list, um, in a Financial Times piece on Friday. Because on Thursday, she's opening her first solo show with Hauser and Worth in London. And this is what her new work is now. So you can see her working on it in her studio in Brooklyn. Um, and so she's gone to painting. And this is a piece called Ice. Um, she's been sort of playing with montage. There's a, a similarity to her old work in that she's doing repetition of form. Uh, but this new body, she's become very interested in ice. She says it appealed to her both visually and metaphorically because it's really inhospitable, she says. You think of Antarctica, not so much climate change, but human ability to live. That became a lens through which I see America at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so much of her work really is about uh, an American race experience. Um, one of the things that she's also credited with doing is kind of blowing up, the blowing open a conversation about race where it's not about performing blackness, like what does blackness look like, so much as what does blackness feel like, what do people that have particular experiences think. Um, and um, so to sort of then go into a direction of painting, using ice as a kind of metaphor for the American experience is interesting, so I'm pretty excited to see what all of these works end up looking like. But um, one of the things that's really exciting about her is that she is so uh, malleable as an artist. Um, the works I showed you were mostly from the 80s, um, but she has another series of collage that integrates color, um, that she pulls a lot from Ebony magazine. Um, so spend some t definitely spend some time with her website because um, that's really a small sampling. She's quite a, quite a chameleon. So Toyin Odwatula um, is only 32. Um, she was born in Nigeria and she uh, lives and works in New York. And in many ways she is a student of someone like Lorna Simpson. Um, she's interested in narrative, in blackness. Um, you may recognize her because today she has a solo exhibition closing at the Whitney. And so that's uh, Toyin on the left. That's uh, Ujiko Hockley, who is the new, uh, a new curator at the Whitney, which was a pretty big deal because Hockley is a young woman of color. Um, she was put into a newly created uh, position at the Whitney. She will be curating the Whitney Biennale next year, or biennial next year. Um, she rolls in a pretty awesome circle uh, Toyin is represented by Jack Shaman, which is one of the heavy-hitting galleries, but particularly they focus on artists of color. Um, and Hockley's uh, husband is Hank Willis Thomas, who that name will come back if you're not familiar with it. I'll circle back to it a little later. So there's quite a few connections here, um, which maybe isn't surprising since most of the artists actually that I'm talking about uh, live and work in New York. And so one thing that I definitely give the Whitney a lot of credit for when we talk about underrepresentation of women and underrepresentation of uh, people of color, the museum is really making a conscientious effort to bring in those marginalized voices, um, but they're bringing in outstanding people. They're not just trying to hit a quota, they're doing it right. Um, and Twain's work is pretty, pretty stellar. So I'll show you kind of, this is a little bit of her earlier work. Um, this is all done with marker. And I'm just going to flip ahead to the next slide and I'll come back. This is to give you some idea of the scale in a gallery setting. Um, so these are not small. Um, the actual dimension on this piece called Quality Control, which is from 2015, is 64 and 3 quarters inches by 41 and 5 16 inches. So my artists in the room will kind of know how big that is. Um, for everyone else, it's about, you know, it's like 6 feet by over 3 feet. So. Uh, large, and it's all done with marker. So these are portraits that are done with really humble materials. She really made her name working actually in ballpoint pen. Um, and these take on this sort of quality of muscle. Um, they've been referred to as sinewy, um, and certainly they are that, but what she's really playing with is the skin as, to, as sort of a geographical landscape and defining blackness sort of in that terms. How, what does it mean to be, um, what does it mean if something is black, if it's brown, if it's gray? And again, this is the scale. 
So this is another piece that's sort of representative of that um, interest in work. So this is called Hold It In Your Mouth A Little Longer. It's from 2013. It's charcoal, pastel, and graphite on paper. And it's 40 by 30 inches. Uh, inches. And so in relation to this, I'll just read a little bit of something, um, uh, some remarks about, from her. So she was asked why the majority of her figures are black. And she said, well, of course they're black figures because they're drawn in black pen. <laughs> Not all of the figures are of African American descent, or at least the reference isn't. One of the things I like to play with is what is black? Is it because I drew it? Is it because it looks black? Is it because you think the figure is black? Because a lot of it is just a filter, and the filters get more and more obstructed by whatever people think the image is about, and not what it really is. So this piece kind of got Tony a pretty big following because it was used on the set of Empire. Um, so I don't watch Empire, but I hear it's like Fox's best watch show, um, and that it has a massive following, and that also, Apparently, the, the creator and the writers and the set designers are really into art, and so they have some really big name artists who have work as, as part of the set design, including Kehendi Wiley, who, as we go through Twain, if you're familiar with his work, which, given his recent portrait of Barack Obama, hopefully you become a little familiar with it. Um, so she's in good company on on the set of Empire. So she, she picked up a few more Instagram followers, which she's a millennial, so she probably had a lot anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not the work that's being shown right now at the Whitney, or you know, up until the end of today. So I'm putting this big block of text up, not because I expect you to read it, or not because I intend to read it to you, um, but because when you walk into her exhibition, which is called To Wander Determined, um, you see this text printed on an eight and a half by 11 piece of sort of creamy paper with an official looking seal at the top. And it sort of sets up what it is that you're walking into, that you're looking at paintings that are, or actually they're drawings, um, that are representative of two different aristocratic Nigerian families. And she has signed it, Deputy Private Secretary Udoka House Lagos. Um, so that sort of sets the tone for what you're going into. You're gonna walk into this sort of fabricated world um, with these characters that she's created um, in environments that she's created. Um, so these are just two of the works that are part of this body of work. Um, and you can see she's now gone from the very controlled, uh, only the gray tones, only the black, to the sort of full technicolor uh, palette. And she's brought in a lot of detail um, in terms of the clothes trying to sort of, you know, what makes upper class? What makes aristocracy? What materials, what objects, what positions, what poses define class? You know, is it that you have a room full of family portraits that have been painted by someone else? Um, is it the way you dress, is it the way you carry yourself? These are all kind of questions that are at play within the works. One of the things that I think is really exciting about these is they're done with chalk pastel and graphite and charcoal. And they're really big. <laughs> um, scale is something that I'm generally very interested in. And you can sort of see that I'm trying to show you scale. And when I get to my last artist, that'll be even more important. Um, so they're big. And so this is all done with what would be sort of humble, you know, things that you start using as an art student. Um, not what you typically expect for monumental portraits, particularly of you know, wealthy, noble families, right? You would expect oil, you know, maybe nowadays, maybe acrylic, but you know, it's the oil painting is the painting of, you know, of the family portrait. Um, and these are just some other installation shots um, from To Wander Determined. And so there actually you can see is another um, sort of letter that she wrote that's on the wall next to one of the other characters in this narrative. Um, this is, I think, one of the ones that's probably been the most Instagram from the exhibition and is probably one of my favorites. It's called Newlyweds on Holiday. Mm -hmm. And it's so phenomenal because of all the different textures and patterns that she plays with. So you can see sort of references to, to Nigeria. You can see references um, 
to an artist like Wiley. You can see references to the Renaissance, and then like a very contemporary, like you know, high-end aesthetic and how they're dressed and how they carry themselves, and that they are a same-sex couple. Um, a few things I forgot to mention about Toyin was that she, besides the fact that she was born in Nigeria, she started her arts education in Alabama. So that's kind of a, I guess you can call it a bit of a culture shock. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, she is someone who is in a lot of her own ways a migrant. And you know, now she's living and working in New York. Um, and so the idea of to wander determined is kind of interesting when you think of her own biography. Um, now I'll move on to Zoe Buckman. Zoe Buckman is also 32. She was born in London and she lives and works in Brooklyn. Um, so Zoe is frequently appearing on lists of kind of activist artists to know now. She's also a really keen dresser um, and really shows up in Vogue a lot, both as an artist but also as a little bit of a you know, contemporary style icon. Um, she says, because we're in a new world and the only we're in a new world, and the only answer is to stand together and act relentlessly. And her artwork is relentless in that it's really about um, the condition of women now. Um, several of the pieces have become sort of rallying points for, um, for women's marches. Um, and I'll go to that first piece that is kind of her best known. This is mm -hmm. called Champ. Um, it's a neon uh, uris with uh, boxing gloves for ovaries. Mm -hmm. So this piece was made in like 2015, 2016. Um, it would actually travel to the Democratic National Convention and was there. Apparently it got a little busted up in transport, um, but it's okay and back on display. Um, but it has become a sort of, again, like rallying point for uh, issues around reproductive rights uh, she has recently, and I said recently, I mean like last night, um, she was awarded a public art commission to put this outside on the Sunset Strip in California, but it's massively tall. It's about three stories, and basically it's just at the top in this circle that's going to rotate um, naturally over time, and the leather boxing gloves have been replaced with a fiberglass boxing gloves, so it'll be a little bit more durable to the elements. Um, and so, you know, the boxing gloves, the battle for women's rights, the battle for reproductive rights. So it's, it's turning into a sculpture. Yeah, so this is, this has been mounted both as sort of a freestanding that you can uh, walk around, but also I've seen it up against a wall. Um, and the piece that her public art piece um, is basically, this has been placed inside a circle and it's on top of a giant flagpole. And so that circular part is going to just rotate naturally uh, to the elements so that all sides can eventually be viewed by, by passers-by. And so that just like went up last night. Where, where on Sunset, do you know? Um, I will double check on her Instagram feed. I can look, thanks. <laughs> Uh, this is another piece of work called Every Curve, and she says it explores the contradictory and complementary influences of feminism and hip-hop in her upbringing. So just like any good child of the 90s, she was really into Tupac and Biggie. Um, hip-hop has a lot of misogynistic lyrics, but she also found some empowering lyrics. Tupac and Biggie, um, both no longer with us, no longer making music. She uses these vintage pieces of lingerie, items that are held close to the body, that are supposed to signify femininity, sexuality, and then she hand embroiders the lyrics from these songs. And she's picked everything from um, thing, text that's violent and misogynistic to what she says is fully sympathetic and pro-choice. So perhaps something like this, I swear I'll never call you bitch again. Um, <laughs> And so these are individually standalone pieces, each garment, but this is how she really conceived of it as a full installation. So you can see there's legs with a hosiery on them, um, the negligees, and so it really be 
when they're hung like this, they kind of take on a body form again. They're not these sort of idle objects in the bottom of a drawer or in a frame. They become animated. And again, there's kind of stories that go with them um, that maybe as a viewer you'll kind of impose when you see the lyric. So Zoe actually um, was in our exhibition that just closed a couple of weeks ago, Give Us the Boat. And this was a piece I really, really wanted. Um, it's called Let Her Rave. And the title comes from a Keats poem, which is Ode on Melancholy. And the particular line in the poem that she was influenced by was, or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. Zoe likes the box. She goes to the boxing gym pretty regularly. Um, but she doesn't really know what to make of this. Imprison her soft hand and let her rave. The idea of potentially confining a woman and letting her lose her anger and feed her deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. So these collection of boxing gloves are actually covered with fabric from wedding gowns. And so sort of in that, um, you know, a lot of kind of loaded connotations, her own biography, um, she was married to David Schwimmer of Friends. Um, so she might also be familiar because they were frequently um, at things together. They are no longer together. Um, and so I'm not sure where this body of work falls in her going through that divorce. Um, but certainly um, the work is, is, raises a lot of questions about the institution of marriage. And is that confining for women or not? Um, and I was interested in these who give us the vote because that was an exhibition that was inspired by the women's suffrage movement. Um, and one of the things that the suffragists did, besides getting women the right to vote, was they changed a lot of legislation um, around women's rights to have access to their children and their rights in marriage. These were the first laws that were passed that allowed women to be able to care for their children after a divorce were made by the suffragists. Um, and also white is frequently associated with the suffragists, so that was kind of why I wanted it. Unfortunately, it wasn't available. Um, one of the other things about Zoe is she is an artist that is part of the super PAC activist group for freedoms. So I mentioned Hank Willis Thomas earlier. That's Hank. Hank is one of the founders. Um, he does everything. Um, next to him is Eric Gotsman. Um, Eric has actually just joined the faculty at SUNY Purchase, which we're all very excited about in the area because he's an outstanding and highly regarded photographer. Behind him um, is the former sort of director of Jack Shaman Gallery. Um, she's left and started her own gallery, so you can see how much the art world is really quite small, um, particularly among certain types of artists. Um, so, Four Freedoms was an activist group, or super PAC, where they were using the super PAC model to give artists an opportunity to be activists, um, to get engaged civically, um, and to get people out to vote. Four Freedoms comes from an FDR speech, um, the inalienable human rights of freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear were the four freedoms that FDR named. So as part of this uh, group, uh, the four freedom, four freedom artists created work that was auctioned to raise money for the super PAC, but they also created work that was part of an advertising campaign. So Zoe's um, best known contribution to this was a billboard that was placed outside of Harrisburg, PA, and grab them by the ballots. So that's as what it was, a billboard. This is what it was at Arts Westchester. Um, we, print, we got to reprint it large scale um, and install it. It is a paint tone locker room, which, and the text, grab them by the ballots, is of course a reference to 45's grab them by the pussy remark. Um, and also a little play on grab them by the balls. We love this piece because it really is a rallying cry um, in the context of our exhibition, but also in the context of um, an activist artwork. 
It's a reminder that we have agency in our democratic process. So if you don't like your leaders, if you don't like the direction our country is headed in, you get to grab them by the ballots. You get to get out there and cast your vote. Um, so it was, a, it was definitely a favorite of the exhibition. Um, Zoe did a few other pieces uh, for, for Freedoms. They sent around this sort of billboard truck that lit up. Um, this was the work that was on the left. She has a whole series of work around gynecological instruments. Um, and so the glasses that Gemma is wearing and her new vision for the future are those things that we all love. All right. All right, so on to artist number five, Alexandra Bell. So she's probably the one that you are least likely to have come across, and that's because she's probably the newest artist. Um, she's in her mid-30s, born in Chicago, and she lives and works in Brooklyn. Alexandra um, came to New York to go to Columbia School of Journalism. She was a journalist in Chicago and then came to New York to get her master's. And she says, if I listened to any part of me, my work couldn't not be political. I don't think I could see myself doing work that doesn't illuminate the lives of the marginalized. I'm a gay black woman. And as someone that came from journalism that's interested in making art and the role that art and words and the news plays in creating meaning and creating a sort of mainstream narrative that gets repeated over and over again and makes the history books, she basically went after the news. So I'm going to show you some process images. So this is kind of draft phase. So what she does is she takes an actual front page from the New York Times. So this was um, the front page of the New York Times on August 25th, 2014. And this was 16 days after the 18-year-old Michael Brown was killed by police officer Darren Wilson. So what she does is she very critically looks at the at the original front page for these inherent biases that we don't really all the way understand are there in journalism, but are, right? The New York Times is supposed to be a liberal paper, but even embedded in how the language is used and how headlines are built and how our images and words are put together on the page, we're reading sort of there's, there's racism, there's prejudice kind of in those decision-making process. So this is all small scale. She's playing with like what things are going to look the best, what am I keeping, what am I getting rid of, and so then this was the final work. This is it in situ, and you can see what she's done. So the original headline had these two biographies, two profiles under the same headline, two lives at a crossroads in Ferguson. Um, a police officer with, what was it, something We'll ignore his for a minute, and we'll go to the one that was with uh, Michael Brown. And it was a teenager who was grappling with problems and promise. And they picked a picture of, the, of Darren Wilson sort of smiling and looking very jovial. And they picked the picture of him with his baseball cap. And she's gone through and she's like redacted almost the entire text, with the exception of office Darren Wilson fatally shot an unarmed black teenager named Michael Brown. And so the rewrite of the front page is a picture of Darren Brown in his cap and gown and the title of Teenager with Promise. Why wasn't this the front page? What's really important, I think, also about Alexandra's work is that it lives in a public space, mostly big, sometimes small. So she's taking a little bit here from the street art space. So these are what you would refer to as paste-ups. So um, street artists work in a lot of different ways. They work with spray can, and they work with wheat paste. So really cheap paper, really simple adhesive. They'll go up really fast, gorilla style, and go stick, stick, and then kind of move on. So she has a bunch of those that are smaller scale that were put in subways around New York that was just a teenager with promise. And then these larger scale works that were mostly sanctioned, um, or she was allowed to put them up, that show the original her redactions or rewrites, and then the final rewrite. Um, this became, this work went viral. Um, it became, she was flooded all of a sudden with messages saying thank you. Um, and all of a sudden she was in the New Yorker. She was in the New York Times. The New York Times 
did a spotlight on her. They never apologized for the editorial decisions, with the exception, and this wasn't because of Bell, um, one New York Times article called referred to Brown as no angel, um, which they later said was a regrettable mistake. Um, but at least the Times gave her some space. And I'll take you through some of the other ones that she's worked on. So similarly, this was the front page of the New York Times during the Rio 2016 Olympics. You may recall that uh, Ryan Lochte and some of the other swimmers were kind of caught up in this sort of weird, ridiculous scandal. Um, they had lied about being held up at gunpoint to cover up the fact that they had vandalized the bathroom. And so once kind of the footage had gone out and it was proved that they had vandalized the bathroom and that they were never held up at gunpoint, the New York Times ran this as their front page. Accused of fabricating robbery, swimmers fueled tension in Brazil. And then directly under that is a picture of Usain Bolt, one of the greatest sportsmen probably of this generation as well as one of the most accomplished athletes of this generation. So even though there's a caption under him, this article above the fold has the word robbery and fabrication next to a black man. Mm -hmm. And accused. Right, accused. Why, mm -hmm. right? There's, so she starts to pull these things apart and going after, remove photo, redo caption, replace with pictures of swimmers, and then the finish, the finished work. Rio gas station footage reveals white American swimmers were offenders. Olympic threat, CCTV footage taken from Shell gas station outside Olympic Park proves Ryan Lochte above. Robbery claimed to be false. Right? And this is my, this is probably my favorite, um, but also points to the front page of the Sports Sunday section. McEnroe, 58, and still fussing. Why are we spending any time talking about him when <laughs> Serena is 37 and still winning, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> so obviously, Alexander and I are on the same page. That's like when you with her. Um, so this is what she's doing in her work. And again, these are large scale. When we're reading the paper, especially now with so many uh, portable devices, you know, it's a very personal, process of getting news, right? A newspaper, maybe we've got it spread out at our table, but it's just us looking at it. If it's on our device, if it's on our news feed, it's like here, it's just us. The importance of putting these works so big and so out in public is all of a sudden it becomes a community conversation. So we get to look at these things and we get to kind of scoff and we get to have our commentary on it. Um, and together we get to kind of realize these embedded prejudices that are in the system, or just have a conversation. Why? Someone can very easily say, well, you know, Usain Bolt, he's got his own caption. You know, that's how the paper's set up. There's like the headline, there's like the left column story, there's the right column story. That's just the way news is written. But that's exactly it. That's just the way news is written, and that's what she's trying to point out. Um, one of the things that she's interested in is not that um, people of color are villainized in the media, it's that white criminals are softened. Um, that she doesn't necessarily feel it comes from a mean place, but one thing that she speaks to is the fact that before slavery ended, there were between 1,500 and 2,000 and 2, daily newspapers in America. That's a lot, <coughs> really. And so even before abolition, there was a sort of way of reporting things. And we kind of lost track of how the news is shared and written, from broadsheet to news feeds, to even curated news based on things you like and are supposed to be interested in. And journalism is supposed to offer a solution to problems. It's supposed to give us the news, all the news that's fit to print. But she points out the news has a point of view. Even the most liberal of papers that maybe right now feels like a salvation in a time of not a lot of salvation, um, it has its own biases and we need to really question how we're getting information and how stories are getting told. Um, does she have to get um, any kind of copyright permission 
to do what she's doing? That's just wondering. A, you know, that's a good question. Just, I'm just wondering about the original author or writer, uh, or reporter, sorry. Um, does she have to ask permission to not only, you know, from the New York Times, but from the original report? You know, I haven't heard anything yet that the Times came down on her in that way. Um, and it's, I'm not sure what things live in public domain. Yeah. Because if it's, a, if it's a photo that she's taken of the front page, it's very different than a reprint of the front page. So there's like gray areas right, like that that right. she can probably negotiate around. Right. Um, I've talked to Alexandra about her work um, because I'm, I'm hoping to work with her for a future exhibition. Um, but that one hasn't come up, and I will actually ask her that. Um, like I said, the New York Times did did interview her, so. What, so right, but she, which I'm sure that's fine about, but it's an interesting question. If she studied journalism too, I wonder if she knows, if she, not, I, a loophole, it seems, I, I, it, seems, it sounds kind of demeaning, I don't mean it like that, but I wonder if she's well educated enough to know there are spaces that she can go into that are still right. totally legal. Right. Clearly, well, clearly there is because yeah. no one's. Well, and the other thing is that I think probably the format that it's taking. So it's not that different really from other types of appropriation art um, where either you're cutting something out of a magazine and using it within the collage, like within mm -hmm. a collage, or you're actually, mm -hmm. again, taking like a right. screenshot of something and using right. it. So you can kind of get around, and because it takes on a different form. There's probably some safe space that she's in with this, but it's not um, an unfair concern. And um, though again, a lot of the work, this isn't, hasn't been that gorilla. She's got a, she's got a wall in Brooklyn where um, basically the building owner lets her, every time she finishes a piece, put up a new one. So she is, Avoiding at least that running with the law mm. um, in terms of in terms of vandalism. Because yeah. often that form, the wheat paste, is quite subversive, isn't it? People yeah. do it like, at night secretly, and it goes up, and then someone tries to tear it down. Yeah. So a sort of cute story. Well, I'll, I'm going to call it cute. Um, sorry about that. Was when she put up the first one. So this was really her first piece. She ended up wheat pasting over another artist's work. His name was Mo. Um, Mo is now her install buddy, <laughs> so um, when she puts these works up, and she did a, a number of them um, at a college in New Hampshire, um, he actually goes with her and puts them up with, with her. So those are my five, and so I'll sort of wrap, I'll wrap up this kind of with this question, why do we still need to talk about women artists? Why does it still matter? Um, why do we have to have a, a lecture called Five Women Artists You Should Know? Why does the National Museum of Women in the Arts put out this challenge every March for people to name five women artists? It's a good question. When we're in 2017, um, women are still grossly underrepresented. I think in the, the little uh, caption for this talk, there was that statistic that more than half of MFA graduates every year are women. but only 30% of artists represented by galleries are women. If you look at leadership in the arts, um, women still grossly underrepresented. There's a lot more directors in museums than there used to be, but they tend to be the smaller museums, the three million, four million, ten million dollar budget ranges, but as soon as you get higher than that, it's all men. Um, women are still, um, their works are fetching considerably less at auction, so there's all of these sort of you know, inequities that exist in the art world that have numbers to go with them. On the other hand, 2017 was a pretty awesome year for women in the arts. So just a few of the things that happened at museums. MoMA had uh, retrospectives of Louise Bourgeois, Louise Lawler. They had the exhibition Making Space, Women Artists in Post-War Extraction. The Brooklyn Museum had We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 85. The Hammer Museum in LA, Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985. PS1 did a retrospective of Carolee Schiemann. Uh, the Guggenheim had an Agnes Martin retrospective, and this is kind of just like quick Google, quick Google search. So women were kind of everywhere in 2017. There were these group shows that made waves that had lots of women artists, and then there were the solo shows. But there's some problems with that, right? So every time we take out and have an exhibition that's 
black radical women artists, we are continuing this sort of process of marginalization. On the other hand, what can be argued is that those women are making work coming from a different space, so their voice is different. But would it be more meaningful to have an exhibition that was We Wanted a Revolution, artists from 1965 to 85, of which women were included alongside them? I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that. But I think the long-term goal for the art world is not to have lectures that are five women artists you should know, but just simply five artists you should know who aren't Frida Kahlo. So I will leave my talking at that and uh, see if anyone has any questions or if you want to have a conversation about either anyone that you saw or kind of anything related to this topic or Arts Westchester. I wanted to comment on the New York Times piece because I'm a newspaper editor mm -hmm. and I graduated from the J School also. Specifically the one with the um, headline and the photo of Usain Bolt. Um, I think this work is incredibly important, what she does. But I know the news judgment that went into that. Um, you had that story with the swimmers. Very big story at the Olympics. But look at the photo and, and the caption. I mean, what Usain Bolt did was the athletic story you know, from the Olympics. Um, with this kind of insight, I might have trimmed his photo and put photos of the white swimmers, you know. But, but that's the judgment that wins that. You've got these two stories, I've got to give them equal prominence, and I don't want to give short shrift to what Usain Bolt did. But then I've got these dopey swimmers that have done their thing. Yeah, but it's... But this analysis is really good. Yeah, I think this is... I mean, these pieces to me, this has... You know, getting familiar with Alexander's work really sort of inspired um, an exhibition that I'd like to do down the road. Um, but just the way, like, accused of fabricating robbery. So when I think of, like, Bell's work in relation to Simpsons, like, it's where does language fit in with images to construct meaning? But then the word choice, accused of fabricating robbery. What a roundabout way of saying, like, lying, right? Or why... Why is it so soft around what it is that they did? Why not just be more direct about it? The image is sort of a secondary thing in some ways because if you are a regular reader of the Times during Olympic season, like that front page carves out a space and it looks exactly like that right now. So during this past Olympics, they have the same huge picture. It says um, Pyeongchang 2018, and it's the same format. Um, but it sounds, it looks almost as if people aren't speaking to each other in terms of when they're making those decisions about what the headline is going to say and then what the image closest to it because people are going to see them as going together when maybe they don't. It's it misleading, right. period. Yeah. And there's been plenty of times I've, I've seen that inset and I, I look for the article. Yeah. And it's in a whole other section. Yeah, exactly. And, and well, sometimes where is it? not even on the front. Yeah. It's like three or four pages yeah, in. Yeah, sections. Yeah. And it also it just raises a really great question to me about like what deserves front page coverage? Why in during the Rio Olympics or during that summer of 2016 is really bad behavior by some athletes worthy of getting the main headline on the front of the New York Times when we were still basically in the middle of an election season? So there's also like in this and she's purposely working with older texts. Um, like she's not taking a headline from yesterday. She's taking one that's got a couple of years um, breathing time, so to speak. So when you sort of see the date and you're kind of putting all that stuff together, you start to ask all these other questions. Like what was going on then that maybe should have been front page instead of Ryan Lochte? Was that the most important thing that we needed to cover in the world that day? Um, and then, you know, similarly, right, like this is her, this is like her, you know, her crowning achievement piece, but um, she said that she never intended this to be a Black Lives Matter piece. That's not what this was about. Um, the whole, this whole body of work is called counter narratives. Um, and so it's just really raising that idea of whose story gets to be the story, whose mm -hmm. point of view gets to be the point of view. So on the one hand, the New York Times could be like, oh, look, we're doing these profiles side by side. We're telling both sides of the story. But how are they framing both sides of the story? Two lives at a crossroads in Ferguson. You know, 
profile of an officer who had some challenging early days, a teenager grappling with, you know, uh, promise and problems, trying to make them on the one hand look like they're coming from a similar place. Both were not perfect people, but he gets a pi the officer gets a picture of him smiling, looking very accessible, and the other one gets a very sort of, you know, stereotypical cat back. Does have a smile on his face, so I'll, I'll give him that much. But so, are they really, are they really equally considered in terms of how they're being framed? Well, not only that, one is alive and one is dead. Right. Right. I mean, which is why her piece is so powerful. That's what she hits. And I actually think, if I go back to the process pieces, that picture um, of Michael Brown is actually somewhere later in in the article mm -hmm. um, and so why they chose to put that other one on the front instead of that one and putting that picture like farther down in the text and again that's something where you kind of need the full paper to sort of question but again it's about being more critical consumers of information but yeah these ones are pretty exciting right I don't Any other thoughts or comments about any of them? I don't want to see a different artist again that they don't quite remember, but want to remember their name or work. Do you have a list of them? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Flashback up. Let's say I saw that Zoe Buckman uterus. The, the uh, neon uterus. There's a uterus in one of the first ones that you showed us. The boat. Mm -hmm. The two boats, there's just a uterus, right? Yeah. I know, right, yeah, that one. Just right in the middle, right? I, like, I got that flashback when I saw the neon one. Um, there was uh, inadvertently a fair amount of pink that turned out, like right up some high again, pink dress. Um, yeah, there's, there's a list of the artists. Um, can you have the other list that the more well-known one? All right, so we got Amy Sherald. Um, who was probably well known in particular circles, but of course she painted the portrait of Michelle Obama that's been having a lot of conversation around it. So she's probably been in the news. So most people um, have a hard time getting past Frida Kahlo, so that sort of little experiment that we ran is not an uncommon problem to have. Um, so getting to the three is usually easier than getting to the five. So Amy is like, people would put in there because she's been so <laughs> attention to. Cindy Sherman, <coughs> this is her more recent work. Mm -hmm. um, I purposely didn't put in her film stills, um, which are her most influential work, but she's still a, such an active artist um, and continues to sort of deal with issues of femininity, um, aging, um, again, construct of wealth and identity. Yayoi Kusama, um, I picked this work to show you as an example, um, in part because right now she's probably, um, people are paying the most attention to her because of her infinity rooms. So these are these small spaces that you go into and they sort of have this infinite quality of all the mirrors, but also because of these small polka dot sort of critters that are in the bottom and that's been a consistent theme of, in her work, which she started making art in the 60s. She blended a lot of performance art um, and now she is this, you know, really cool lady who I think is in her, her I think she's in her 80s. Um, she's done some great collabs with Louis Vuitton and um, she's kind of a rock star and a character. But this is the work that's kind of getting, you know, is making her really popular again. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, whatever. Um, and then Frida. And I don't know, when I, when I say that Emily Carr is kind of the Frida Kahlo of Canada, I think one of the things that's just interesting is how certain artists become these like rock star icons where you do have Selma Hayek doing a biopic. She has a very interesting life, right? She had these really, this incredibly strong uh, body of work, but she is kind of the default. Um, when somebody wants to do an exhibition of women artists or of a woman artist, like, Frida's kind of the first one they go to. I think the first exhibition I ever remember going to of a woman artist was an exhibition of Frida Kahlo's work when I was like a teenager and my family and I were out in California. 
Um, and it was very powerful, and it was really great work. But I don't really remember the next time that I went to an exhibition of a work by a women artist. The New York Botanical Garden, right? They're doing, you know, flowers and Frida Kahlo paintings for like the fifth time. Probably not. That's probably not being fair. <laughs> but definitely not the first time. Um, but why has that happened? What makes her work so approachable or so interesting or her bio so interesting that she completely eclipses everybody else? And I think that just asking that question is important and I don't think it needs to be answered, but why? And this is kind of what all of these artists are doing in their work and kind of why I gravitated to them. It's like, well, why this story? Why these people? Um, so like Emily Carr has a prolific body of work. I'm not the person to say that it's on par with Frida Kahlo, but it's just interesting how she isn't in the same place, at least in terms of, you know, the American, um, you know, the textbook that I have on American art. The group of seven doesn't make any appearance, and Emily Carr doesn't make any appearance, but they're both, you know, artists that, they're both groups of artists that were working in North America, but they're not, you know, let's talk about Jackson Pollock, let's not talk about this thing that's happening north of the border, but we can look south of the border. But not north of the border. Mm -hmm. I'm half Canadian, so if that doesn't show, that like to a wee bit of prejudice. <laughs> things in Canada, there's things there besides maple syrup. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really great art. I also had a thing that the boxing gloves covered in wedding dresses. I mean, to me, there was obviously a kind of latent violence in that. Image. Oh yeah. And you didn't mention much about violence, but it seemed to be kind of built into the. Oh, for sure. The idea of using boxing gloves, which is a controlled and yet ultimately violent fighting right. symbol. You're, you're aiming for the TKO or, you know, to put them, to put them <laughs> on the ground. Yeah, so there's yeah, a lot so of... It's kind of terrifying in a way. It yeah. is. It's mm -hmm. very accessible and it's kind of pretty, but then you realize that if are these boxing gloves that are at weight, um, what are they going to be used for? So, you know, as I mentioned in Zoe's own biography, she, she goes out and she boxes and she's frequently posting pictures of herself with black eyes. Um, so obviously she needs to go to a few more classes. But um, so there is a there is a inherent violence in that that you know these women or these characters maybe have to arm themselves like what. But she's very stylish as well. So she's very feminine and powerful at the mm -hmm. same time. And I think that's everything she she poses and shows Absolutely. about it. even the the um, the vices that she made the black all mm -hmm. in pink. So she's you know, very almost sweet, but tough. Exactly, and that's I think why her work is really approachable. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at kind of her website and you look at the body of work, she's, she plays a lot in these candy colors, like the pinks and the lavenders and these sort of traditionally feminine tones. Um, but there is a toughness in her work, and even in that quote that I put up, that we have to stand together and act relentlessly. Um, and so that neon has this sort of luxurious, intoxicating quality, but then the area that's supposed to be the ovaries are these boxing gloves, and whether you want to read it as these little eggs that are going to come out are going to be ready to take on the world and fight, or whether it's that women have to fight to keep the right to control how their body is used, um, yes, there's absolutely an inherent violence in them, but also that the other way to read it is that it's about empowerment, and that maybe those soft hands aren't being held back, but can be put to pretty good, pretty good use. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you.